Hi, welcome to the OGSR Library. My name's Jordan. I'm the presenter in the video that you're about to see, which was first delivered at the EPIC's 59th Annual Conference in London, Ontario. This is the VR edition for stereoscopic headset, so if you have one of those, put it on now and you'll be able to see all the models in stereoscopic 3D. If you're not watching in a headset, you can use the link around the window to watch the 2D version of this video. Please enjoy, and if you watch it in a headset, let us know if that helps with your understanding and immersion in the models. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to take a look at all this data that we have on our computers and see how we can take that uh, out into the real world and if we should even do that. I'd like to first of all thank the Geological Survey of Canada and the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. Without them, this wouldn't have been possible. So here's the information that we have. Uh, points representing wells that have been drilled. So a single point is a well that you've drilled somewhere. And all the points together is the data that we have housed at the library. And hopefully, someone has picked uh, the same data as they've picked all these points. So this is actually representing the Precambrian surface. And we can bring this into our GIS, this grid of points. And we get some sort of a layer that looks kind of like this. You're familiar with this uh, gridding and contouring. So an exercise you would do in GIS to create a 2D map. And this is the Precambrian surface. And directly overlying that, of course, is the Cambrian, which has kind of been a hot topic recently because of the talk about carbon sequestration and also some exploration for oil and natural gas still. And that point there is a hypothetical well point that we might want to drill. And so we might want to see what the depth to the Cambrian or Precambrian surface is at that point. And this two-dimensional image here, shaded where high points are lighter and lower elevations are darker, this is all we need to, uh, to print a 3D model. So you could just send this to your 3D printer and print it out. And in fact, I've done that. So you can uh, take a look at it at our booth uh, at one of the breaks. And that's all there is to it. Not quite, right? Uh, I have some help with me today. So Matt and Mary Rose, also from the library, made a presentation at the Groundwater Open House on how we made a four-layer model of the Paleozoic bedrocks of Ontario. And they're going to be joining me virtually to help out uh, with that part of the talk. Hi, I'm Mary Rose Darienzo, a GIS technician. I'm Matt Dupont, a media and information technician. So why would we want to do this anyways? So how about we want to turn uh, abstract data into shapes that we can inspect? We want to create miniatures of places that we can't visit. So that Precambrian surface, you can't go there. It's buried. So let's, let's dig it up and see what it looks like. Uh, discussion and outreach. So it's a good place to start a conversation. And it sits on your desk, so people can walk by and see it. It doesn't take any power. It doesn't take any technology to use. It doesn't take a license or anything. It just persists, and you can inspect it at any time. 3D printing gives us the ability to take three-dimensional models created in a digital workspace and bring them back into reality with scientific precision. This gives the user the ability to hold and rotate a physical model made with real-world data allowing for analysis of its geometry in a situation where its shape is intuitive. You can see and feel the Algonquin Arch and how the layers dip down into the Chatham Sag. Run your finger along the edge of the Niagara Escarpment. Having these features physically accessible makes this a valuable educational tool. So workflow number one, the simplest workflow, is what we saw at the beginning there. We have a GIS surface, the kind that you would make for any sort of two-dimensional map, a gridding and contouring. The output to that is an image file, and that image can be sent directly to your 3D printer for printing. And this is the output of that. So you can see the model. It's the basic shape of the Precambrian surface, and we've got the well point here on the model. It's a little bit hard to see in the image, maybe, but you can see it at the booth. So the well point shows you where the ground elevation is. What about something a little bit more complicated? So this is similar to what we did for the four-layer model that we also have at the booth, and Matt and Mary Rose are going to speak about. So we start with our geology database, make sure that we've done some QAQC to ensure the data is 
high quality and we're mapping what we think we're actually mapping. We use GIS or modeling software. In the case of the four layer model, we used LeapFrog, uh, but you could do this with your, your GIS software, ArcGIS, QGIS, whatever it is that you're using. The output can be a surface image or the output can be a modeled volume. So LeapFrog, when we made the four layer model output uh, an already produced three dimensional volume. Um, so there's a number of different formats you can use. Image formats, uh, OBJ format, which is what we used, is a wavefront object, is a standard three-dimensional file. Or an STL, which is a standard triangle library or a standardized uh, tessellation language, is another way of uh, representing three-dimensional objects, uh, especially in CAD. Um, then we want to go into our three-dimensional modeling software. So in our case, we actually use a software called Blender, which is uh, an open source software, but you could also use a CAD-based software for, for modeling. And we, we want to take it into this three-dimensional software to add elements that, that you wouldn't have on the model just from your GIS or modeling package, things like labels, uh, QR codes, scale bars, north arrows. Uh, the QR code that we put on the model is something that we use to upgrade the model after we've shipped it. So, we can create uh, augmented reality assets and link that to the QR code so when you hit the model with your phone, you get the latest version. And this is just a really fast sped up overview of kind of what it looks like to create this model. So this is uh, taking a snip of the four layer model. I've created a surface here that's sliced up into uh, 50 micron slices, which is the resolution of the printer. Uh, so it matches the printer and I'm just projecting it down onto the surface, which is already existing. This tends to work better than, than the surfaces that come out of the modeling software because they're not exactly in the right shape for 3D printing, although they can work. Uh, you could also displace one of these surfaces with a, with a two-dimensional image, a black and white image from your GIS software. Um, so here I'm just displacing. I've got all four layers. Uh, the red layers are actually inside out, so it's a fun thing. And, in 3D modeling, you can actually have inside-out models. So we've done some work to correct those. And now I'm fine-tuning the model here, uh, slicing it up. So there's a number of different ways to slice it, putting on the labels, adding some scale bars, uh, moving the text around. And then that all gets merged into one solid object that'll get sent to the printer. And let's see how Matt and Mary Rose did it for the four-layer model. To prepare the model for printing, Layers from the lithostratigraphic model of Southern Ontario were combined and exported as wavefront objects using LeapFrog Works. Model objects were then edited using Blender, a common and powerful open source 3D modeling software. This is where titles, scales, and additional model features are created and combined with the existing model into one solid piece. Objects are then sent to print slicing software to prepare printer-specific instructions such as print resolution, material type, and build position. So continuing the workflow, uh, the parts that we just saw there, we take that true 3D model, which we've created in our modeling software, and we can use that for 3D printing, but it's also useful for other things. So we've used the models inside videos, virtual reality experiences, as augmented reality objects. Uh, you can use them in games as assets as well, uh, outreach style games, so all kinds of things. Uh, we send that model to our print slicer in the case of printing it, and we can choose between different printing, uh, printing materials. So at the library, we're using an FDM printer, which is a fused uh, deposition modeling. It uses a PLA, polylactic acid filament, and fuses that with heat. Or we can make a resin-based print with SLA, a stereolithography, uh, which is the higher resolution but higher cost option. And after the model is printed, there's a little bit of post-processing, which you'll see. And then we want to do something with the model, right? We didn't just print it because it was cool or fun, even though it was. Uh, we want to take this model out and show it to people and uh, use it for something useful. So this is preparing the model that you saw me mocking up in Blender for, for printing. In this case, I'm gonna print it on our FDM machine. I wanna make a fairly large print uh, I ended up printing it about uh, 25 centimeter cube. It'll print up to a 45 centimeter cube. Um, here it is just simulating how the print head moves around so you can kind of see what it would look like when it's, when it's in action. And eventually we get the output, 
which is this printed model here. The model is also at the booth if you want to take a look at it when you're walking around during one of the breaks. Uh, and in this case, we used a color change filament. So as the model prints up, the color of the filament changes. And so this works pretty well for illustrating things like change in elevation. And so this, this model is showing the Dawn 156 pool, uh, which is a large reef mound or pinnacle reef. And we're showing the Rochester uh, Gasport Goat Island formations on here. And they're sliced, uh, sliced away so you can see how each one of those formations builds on top of each other to build this reef mound. Welcome to our 3D printing lab. Today we're going to demonstrate printing the Precambrian layer using two different kinds of 3D printer. The FDM style printer stands for Fuse Deposition Modeling. This type of printer uses heat to fuse a filament that's fed through a small tip onto the building platform. The resolution is 400 microns. Will it be enough to print all the fine details on this layer? We'll see at the end. Uh, with this printer, once the printing is finished, the piece is done. There's no post-processing. It's ready to go. SLA stands for Stereolithography Apparatus. With this printer, the building platform is lowered into a tray of resin and ultraviolet light fuses from below. This printer has a smaller building platform. It has a higher resolution. It can print as small as 25 microns. We're using 50 microns for this project. Once the printing part is finished, there's still a lot of work to do to finish the piece. There's still a lot of sticky resin left on it. There's a lot of small details. These will need to be pre-rinsed a little bit with isopropyl, canned air to blow out some of the more stubborn parts. Then it'll take a bath in pure isopropyl in the cleaning station. And once the isopropyl is dry, it goes into the curing station where it will be cured under ultraviolet light. Once cured, we need to remove the building wrap. So we have to clip each support post and then just peel off the wrap and then you're left with all kinds of little bits and nubs that need to be sanded off. And then the piece just needs a final rinse, a little scrub with the toothbrush and a little polish with the magic eraser to finish the job. And now let's look closely at the two prints side by side. From a distance we can see that both printers have done a great job replicating the shape. A closer look at the FDM style print shows that the finish isn't as smooth. You can see a bit of a swirly pattern, uh, essentially the lines drawn on by the filament. With the FDM style print, you can see that the smaller letters were not reproduced. The FDM printer wasn't able to reproduce the QR code. Uh, there's not enough detail here for this to work. So to achieve the level of detail we're going for, the SLA printer is really the right tool for this job. We plan to use the FDM style printer for other projects, say for larger pieces, and there's been talk of a geology-based puzzle project. And now another look at some other models that we've printed. So this one is, uh, again, with the SLA, held together by magnets, so the pieces kind of click together. And the bottom layer is showing a physical surface, and the top two layers are showing a data surface. So you can see it snapped together there. So the blue and the clear are actually water flux, so it's showing, it's showing the magnitude of your data. And here's just another look at the four-layer model that we've been printing. Uh, the four-layer model, of course, is available to look at the booth. And you can see here just some of the details on the model. Uh, we have each of the major geological uh, time periods. We were able to reproduce some really fine details. Uh, the city names are embedded in there and the text as well. And the city place markers are snaps that hold the model together. With the SLA style printer, we're able to print the fine enough detail that the parts can actually have things like snaps. And on the surface there where we have a lot of data, you can see a lot of roughness there. So what have we been doing with these models? Well, we've printed about 30 of the four-layer models to date. We've sent them to schools, to professors, to researchers. Uh, they've been used in public and community outreach. And we've so far gotten quite positive feedback from these models uh, because they're easy to pick up, for anyone to understand. You know, different age groups can understand the, the shapes of the models pretty easily. We give them different information depending on how technical they are. Uh, and it's just easy to use, and uh, it's a good conversation starter because it's always available on people's desks, the people who have them, and people will ask, uh, uh, you know, ask about it just because it's sitting there and not sitting on your computer somewhere. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation. To keep track of this project, you can follow us on social media, check out our YouTube channel, 
go to our webpage, www.ogsrlibrary.com, and sign up for our newsletter. Thanks. Thank you, Matt and Mary Rose, and thank you all for listening.